Good morning. My name is David. We're on week 17 of 52 churches in 52 weeks. If you want to send some good vibes, hit the like button and subscribe. If not, well, shoot, that, that was my best pitch. So maybe, maybe think about it. Uh, for today, we're going to be checking out the First Unitarian Society in Madison, Wisconsin. This is a Unitarian Universalist church, which is considered one of the more liberal type of religious movements out there. So there's two reasons uh, I picked this one. Number one, uh, during the first 52 churches in 52 weeks that I did eight years ago, wrote a book about it. You can check it out on Amazon in the link below. Um, I write about my first encounter there where it was such an artistic service. It was winter solstice and it was almost like a play inside of church. It was so different. They, you know, they turn off the lights. They did this reenactment of like the sun rising. But I remember kind of after I left, it's like I'd seen a poster and the poster had the top 100 most influential Unitarian and Universalists um, that had ever been, that had ever lived. And one of the pictures they had was Charles Darwin. So they had a picture of Charles Darwin in church, but I don't remember any recollection of any images of Jesus Christ or any mentions of Jesus Christ. It was so different to be in church without Christ in it. Second reason I'm picking this one is uh, when I did this before, I had a certain fondness that I developed for church architecture and uh, went to a Greek Orthodox church and saw um, the building that was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. And Frank Lloyd Wright, he's considered by many to be one of the greatest American architects of all time. And he designed a number of buildings, hundreds and hundreds of them, including churches. Well, as I came to learn later on, Frank Lloyd Wright was a Unitarian and he designed and helped to build his own Unitarian church about less than two hours away from where I live. So for today, I'm gonna to be checking out this Unitarian Universalist meeting house. Um, there's, there's gonna be a 9 a.m. tour, and then right afterwards, there's gonna be a service. So gonna check this out. So let's just cue the montage. So I had to take a few extra days to think about uh, this particular church visit because uh, I really didn't know what to make out of everything because there was just so much that I witnessed. Um, from the first 52 and 52, uh, one anonymous quote that I really liked to explain Unitarian Universalism was, uh, if you have questions, we got more questions. And I think one of the biggest questions that I took away from this is, what's grounding uh, this faith all together? Because with Christianity, you have Jesus, you have the Bible. When it comes to Muslims, you have Muhammad, you have the Quran. When it comes to the Jewish faith, you have uh, the Law of Moses, Ten Commandments, and the Torah. With Unitarian Universalism, I don't know what is the one thing that everything you can derive it from because I saw just so many different things. I saw flags, I saw signs, I saw artwork. 
um, all these things that promoted social justice and social activism. Uh, there were poems. There were 1960s music. There was architecture. There was theology. There was discussions about Jesus flipping tables. There was a story about Buddha being spit on by a merchant. There was this and then also, uh, when it came to science and telescopes and how the universe is expanding. And I don't really know, after visiting this, is as a denomination, what does you youism? what can you hold your hat on and be like, yep, this is a central belief to really kind of anchor this faith. And on top of that, it's like, what kind of questions can I ask? because there's a lot of things that I saw that doesn't perfectly align uh, with my own belief system and convictions. Uh, but at the same time, like I'm, when I'm doing the 52 churches in 52 weeks, I want to defeat previous biases that I had been conditionally um, developed from childhood. How can I be ha and have an open mind uh, when I'm doing these church visits and take some gold out of it to understand what a church is all about that I may not particularly um, align and subscribe to. So if I guess if there was one word that I could say to explain Unitarian Universalism with this visit, the one word is abstract. And it's almost kind of like I had to take off my, uh, my normal kind of my glasses and instead kind of look at this as like being in an art gallery. Because you know when you're in an art gallery, you, you kind of, you fold your arms together, um, you squint your eyes, you tilt your head, you kind of do this with your chin when you're looking at a piece of art. And to one person that may be an absolutely beautiful, amazing piece of art, to another person it may just be like, I don't get it. And I think for this one, it's like I really had to like look at this and kind of understand like what am I looking at? So my visit started with a 9 a.m. tour and uh, there were two other couples uh, that were there with me. And the tour guide kind of went over some of the different things that the church had been doing to be uh, going green, sustainable energy, um, solar panels, all that kind of stuff. And eventually he brought us over to uh, the meeting house and uh, the first thing you notice is the roof. So I'm six feet tall with shoes on. And even for me, like my head almost was hitting this very strange abstract roof. And the tour guide explained that Frank Lloyd Wright, like his mind didn't work like yours or mine. Like he was a different breed. And his reasoning was he wanted to make the roof four feet off the ground because his reasoning was if you're going to church, you should bow your head. So they did that originally, but eventually someone had to come along and be like, I think it was with the building code where it's like, you can't have a roof four feet off the ground, like you're going to get someone hurt. So they had to, I guess, from what I understand, they had to dig a hole um, into the ground to make it at least six feet from the from the ground up uh, to, for this to work. So the tour guide eventually brought us inside and he explained some more stories with Frank Lloyd Wright where uh, he had this r love of wood and the way that he saw it is he wanted it to be sustainable and use as much as he could because he didn't want the forest to just end up as a bunch of sawdust. So when it came to the, the building and the design of it, uh, he wanted it to be only two by fours, but when it came to some of the guys that were actually building the actual structure, like they needed to use like a steel beam. They needed to use by two by sixes in addition. So they kind of had to go behind his back to actually complete the construction because it just wasn't going to work. And I was kind of surprised with Frank Lloyd Wright because he's considered this amazing American architect, but from the stories that the tour guide kind of mentioned, it's like people hated him. Uh, the tour guide eventually brought us into, uh, I guess it was the hearth of the building. And there was like this little octagon type of ceiling. And the names were interesting because it contained some of Frank Lloyd Wright's 
um, I, I wouldn't say idols, but just people that had a big impact on him, especially when it came to nature. So one of the two of the names that I noticed was Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson. So these great American writers. And another thing, as you got into the actual church area, uh, the tour guide mentions like one of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's biggest inspirations when it came to architecture was Beethoven, the composer, because Frank Lloyd Wright just had this appreciation for music and what Beethoven did to structure the tunes and the melodies and everything that went along with his music. So when it came to the building of the church, he was trying to do everything he could to amplify the music to make it uh, that, more, that much more impactful for those who were in the building. Eventually 10 o'clock rolled around and I was in the Meeting House Church where I thought the service was supposed to start, but no one was coming in. So the tour continued. We went down some hallways, went into some other rooms. But by this time, I was like, man, church is... Like, I had to check my phone. Like, did I miss something in this? So eventually I asked the tour guide, okay, I thought there was a church service at 10 o'clock. Where is it? And he mentioned it was on the other end of this horseshoe-like building expansion. So the tour wrapped up, I went over to the atrium, and from the naked eye from outside, it looked like a very small glass hallway. Like you had uh, some flags to promote social activism with the LGBTQIA flag, the Ukraine flag. I walk in, and next thing I know, on the left side, I hear music. And they had a huge, huge auditorium built on the side of the hill that you never would have seen from the outside. So uh, went through the doors and they had signs up everywhere that you had to wear, you had to wear a mask. That was a requirement. And found a seat towards the side. They were playing um, uh, that 1960s song, Chet Powers. Uh, I'm going to try and sing it. Uh, da, 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 turn, 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 you know, kind of like, it felt a little like hippie-like, because I think they also did another uh, Pete Seeger type of song. And eventually, um, it was called Reflections. So they had two preachers, both of their names were Kelly, and uh, the gentleman preacher, he was wearing like Converse sneakers with this, with his black pastoral gown. It was, it was such a different different uh, contrast in clothing. And they would do like this tag team tandem preaching. Now understand, I walked in 30 minutes late. I had no context on what they were preaching about. So to me, when I first saw it, they just were doing these mini sermons on just random topics. One was about Jesus flipping tables and how it could be misconstrued as a riot, as Jesus being a writer or a paramilitary operation. And then the other Reverend Kelly kind of mentions about uh, the James Bell, I think is his name, with the telescope that's showing the universe expanding and being bigger and us being smaller as a result. And there were just all these different type of topics that I didn't know what was grounding the whole church service or the sermon. And there were other type of literature type of readings brought forward and eventually it led to another song and then finally the benediction and the benediction um, one of the reverends kind of mentions something about white privilege and leaving it at the door that's why I heard it first and I remember walking out where it's like what what is this and it I had to review and see the church service online to kind of understand, wait a minute, this church service and all the talks, they were answering questions from the congregation. So all these hard hitting type of topics and subjects, they, they had, the reverends had to do it in such a, this, this, you know, abstract linguistic type of way that sounded extremely intellectual but it wasn't simple. So when I was hearing it at the first time, I'm just like, it was just going straight over my head. I had no idea what the point was. So when I learned that, like my, my, 
my understanding of this church service flipped a little bit. But at first, I'm just like, what is this? Like, I am so confused in terms of what they're getting at. One question that I got doing this the first time was, why did you go to churches that weren't necessarily Christian? And it's a good question. And I found myself where the answer was actually some of those churches were the most impactful visits to my faith. Because it's almost like a child. Like, oh, you're so sick of mom and dad always being with you. If you could just grow to be older and get out of the house and be by yourself, it'd be so much better. But then if you get lost in the mall and you don't have mom and dad there, you feel lost. And I kind of felt a little bit like that in a church where there was no cross, there was no um, Jesus Christ as my savior kind of feeling. And it kind of hit me where it's like, man, I need, I need Christ in my life more than ever. Um, for this visit, like there was no cross, but there was this very abstract, and we use that word again here, this abstract design up front that looked like it had like some wooden pieces to it. And it kind of got, so I centered myself on that wooden structure. And again, when it comes to Unitarian Universalism, when it comes to a deity, when it comes to God, it's kind of like whatever, whatever floats your boat when it comes to a higher deity and who that is. So for me, that was kind of my cross. That was my wooden structure. Because if you look in the Bible, in the beginning of the Bible, you had two trees. You had the tree of life and you had the tree of good and evil. And what did man choose? They picked the wrong one. It caused the world to go into a downward spiral with the fall of man. What happens? Well, man completely decimates and destroys the trees and they make that tr they make a tree into a weapon of mass destruction when it comes to agony and death with the cross. And Jesus, when he died on that, essentially transfigured that into a new symbol to show how he had saved us from our sins. Uh, one quote that I really like is from George Herbert. I mentioned this in the book. Uh, o all ye who pass by, behold and see, man stole the fruit, but I must climb the tree, the tree of life to all, but only me. And that really resonated with me. And one thing I learned just recently, and I can't remember which, which YouTube channel that I saw this on, the Bible also ends in Revelation with the mention of the tree of life. So you have the trees kind of bookended in the Bible and in the very center, the cross. It's symmetrical. It was basically a device that man made to, that screwed everything up. And looking at this structure, it was kind of like a more like a postmodern type of cross to me, because what are we doing in today's society with, you know, the current the way that the current world is going like like i'm trying to like look at that and it's like is that is that the cross can i interpret that as us as humans right now kind of dismantling the current religious structure that's out there nowadays and we're trying to make it into our own so again it's it's in the beauty is in the eye of the beholder and i'm just kind of like looking at that like some kind of piece of art in an art gallery, squinting my eyes and just kind of being like, is there, is there something here? Is there something that I can take away from this visit um, from that particular structure? Tell you what, that's gonna wrap up week 17 for 52 churches in 52 weeks. Hope you liked uh, this video from this week. If you like to stay up to date for future visits, hit the like button and subscribe. As always, if you want to read about the first 52 churches in 52 weeks, it's on Amazon. Link is in the description box below. So thanks for watching and hope you have a good one.